so let's find this video. So let's go to Hacker. On the previous Haskell Run video, I implemented a fold operation and I assumed that it was the left fold, but apparently it was the right fold. It only works because the LCM and GCD operations are commutative. So it doesn't really matter in our case which fold we use, left fold or right fold, it's still going to work because LCM and GCD are commutative. So <laughs> I wanted to make this video as an opportunity to actually correct myself and explain why my fold implementation was actually right fold and how to implement left fold. So yeah, sometimes I make mistakes. I'm, I'm a professional software developer, by the way. Have I mentioned that? I think I did. Okay, let us remind ourselves what is a left fold and what is a right fold. Imagine that we have a, a function f with signature that looks like that. So basically it takes two arguments uh, with the same type and returns the value with the same type. And we have a list that contains some values. So what is a left fold? Left fold is is reducing that list applying function f in the following fashion. We apply f to a1 and a2, then we take this value and apply f to it and a3 and so on and so forth. So you see this entire expression leans towards the left side, so that's why it's called left fold. What is the right fold? So you pretty much do the same thing, but try to iterate starting from the right. So you apply f to a3, a4, then f to a2 and the previous expression, and so on and so forth. So you see in this case, this reduction leans towards the right side. That's why it's called the right fold. So let's take a look at how we implemented the fold operation in the previous video. We defined fold as a function that takes another function with the following signature, then it takes a list and returns a reduced value. So we have a special cases, uh, for example, when the list is empty, in that case we return an error. When the list contains one value, we return that value, and when the list uh, contains more than one value. In that case, we did apply f to x and the recursive call to fold. So, when I was explaining my solution in the previous video, I assumed that it's a left fold for some reason, but this is actually a right fold. And we can prove that by doing the reduction of this function application. So let me show you what I mean. Let's try to apply fold to some f and our list of four elements. So what is a reduction? Basically the reduction is the process that is performed by Haskell itself. It takes a function application and matches it against a corresponding patterns. So if it matches a particular pattern, it basically replaces this entire expression with its corresponding implementation. So let's try to iteratively do the same manually. Let's take this expression and see what pattern it matches. It matches this particular pattern, basically pattern where we have more than one value in the list. So in that case, what we have to do, we have to replace this entire expression with this. X in our case is going to be the first element of the list. So we have to replace it with a1. F is going to stay the same and X is going to be the tail of this particular list, a2, a3, and a4. After that, we continue the process until it stops. So we take this fold and match it against the patterns. Uh, it matches this pattern. So that means we have to replace this entire fold with this value. X in our case is going to be head of the list, A2, and X is going to be the tail of the list, A3 and A4. Okay, we still have fold, the process is not finished, so we have to continue. We have to replace this particular fold with its body. X is going to be the head uh, of the list, A3, and X is going to be the tail list with a single value, A4. So as you can see, we still have fold, so the process isn't finished, we continue that. And notice that this expression matches this pattern, so that means we we have to replace this entire expression with a4. And we can clearly see that this is the right fold. So we just proved that it's not the left fold, it's a right fold by doing the reduction iteratively. So to correct ourselves, let's try to implement fold L from the standard library. Since it's fold L, it doesn't have the default value and we will have to provide the default value ourselves. So it takes a function from a to B, collapses it to A, then the default value, then the list of Bs and the collapsed value. This is the signature of the fold L function we are going to work with. But in the standard library, we have a slightly different signature. So you see, instead of taking a list to reduce, it takes T, which is foldable. And a foldable is a more abstract thing than list. So basically, fold L can work with anything 
that can fold. Things that can fold are not only lists, but for example, maybe can also fold, either can also fold, pairs of tuples can also fold. So basically structure like that can be folded. It's really interesting. So basically I can just apply plus zero, like that. Yeah, you can fold tuples. In the standard library, fold is more abstract. But uh, for the sake of simplicity of explanation, we're going to work with the fold that works with lists. Let's start the fold f implementation. But the problem is we already have fold l in the standard library. So what we have to do, we have to hide fold l from the standard library. In Haskell, we have a module called prelude. Prelude is a module that contains names that automatically export it to your scope because those names are used quite frequently. You want to have them in your scope all, all the time. So fold L is a function that is used frequently and it's in prelude. So to hide it from prelude, we have to import prelude hiding fold L. And after that, we will be able to use fold. Uh, let's see what cases we have for fold L. We have a case when the list is empty. In that case, we have to return base. And another case is when the list is not empty and we have to continue the fold recursively, reducing base and the head of the list into a new base and continuing to fold the tail of the list. So we can check that it actually works. For example, we can try to fold 10 elements of the list and yeah, it's actually 55. So let's try to prove that this implementation is actually left fold. To make a reduction, we have to have an identity element for f to put it in the base. Since we're working with f that is abstract, it's not that easy to do. Let's try to define something that is called f id. It's not going to be really defined, it's something undefined, but it is going to be an identity element for function f. And what I mean by that, uh, I mean that if you apply f to something and f id, you will get a. And if you apply f to f id and a, you will also get a. So basically f id, it's some element that is neutral to f. You can actually encounter neutral elements like all over the place. For example, if you were with plus operation, right? A plus operation also takes two elements. For plus operation, such neutral element is going to be zero. For multiply operation, such element is going to be one, right? Because if you, for example, multiply five by one, it's going to be five. And if you multiply one by five, it's still going to be five. It's a neutral element. So I want to like reason about fold abstractly. So I need a, a, an identity element, like a neutral element. So let's actually denote it as FID and just continue reasoning about things. So let's reduce with f our list of four elements using fid as the base. So the first thing we do, we pattern match this entire expression. It matches this particular pattern. So that means we have to replace it with this. Base is going to be equal to fid, x is equal to head, and x is equal to tail. Since we have f defined for fid, we can straight up replace this entire expression with a1. Because you see, we already have that. We define that f applied to fid and a is equal to a. That means this entire expression is equal to a1. So that's exactly the reason why I introduced that sort of fake id element. So let's continue pattern matching this entire expression. It still matches this case and that means we have to replace it with this again. Base is a1. x is the head, see, the head of the list, and axis is the tail, a3 and a4. Continue pattern matching, still matches this case, replacing with this. Base is equal to this expression, as you can see. So we straight up remove the base and replace it with this, then x is equal to head, a3, and axis is equal to tail, which is a4. Pattern matching still matches this case, replacing with this. Base is equal to this, x is equal to a4 head and x is equal to empty list. Pattern matching again and it doesn't match this case anymore, but it matches this one. And in this one, we have to replace this entire expression with the base. And the base is this. And you see, this is exactly what we called left fold. So once you have fold L, it is actually easy to implement fold L1 in terms of fold L. Let's try to do that. Fold L1 is going to have this signature, exactly the signature I wanted to have for fold, right? And for fold L1, we have two cases, when the list is empty, which yields an error, and when the list is not empty. And in that case, we, we can use the hat 
of the list as the base for fold L. F X axis. This is exactly what I wanted to implement in my video, but instead of fold L1, I actually implemented fold R1. That's pretty much everything that I wanted to say about fold.